remind me once again just who I am because I need to know. Finding myself at a loss for words And the funny thing is, it's okay The last thing I need is to be heard But to hear what you would say
finding myself in the midst of you beyond the music beyond the noise all that I need is to be forgetfulness the chains of yesterday surround me I yearn for peace and rest I don't want to end up where you found me and it echoes in my mind keeps me away tonight I know you've cast my sin as far as the east is from the west and I stand before you now as, as though I've never sinned. But today I feel like I'm just one mistake away from you leaving me this way. Jesus, can you show me just how far the east is from the west? Because I can't bear to see the man I've been. Come rising up in me again in the arms of your mercy I find rest Cause you know just how far the east is from the west From one scarred hand to the other day the war begins endless reminding of my sin and time and time again your truth is drowned out by the storm I'm in today I feel like I'm just one mistake away from you leaving me this way Jesus can you show me just how far the east is from the I can't bear to see the man I've been Come rising up in me again In the arms of your mercy I find rest Cause you know just how far the east is from the west From one scarred hand to the other I know you've washed me white Turned my darkness into light I need your peace to get me through, to get me through this night. I can't live by what I feel, but by the truth your word reveals that I'm not holding on to you, but you're holding on to me. You're holding on to me. Jesus, you just 
just how far the east is from the west. And I don't have to see the man I've been rising up in me again. In the arms of your mercy, I find rest. Cause you know just how far the east is from the west. One scarred hand to the other. Well, good morning. Good morning. Welcome. I'm glad you're here. This morning we're going to be participating in the Lord's table. And uh, so as you came in, if you didn't pick up the bread and the cup, this would be a good time maybe to go get it. If you're watching online at home, it would be a good time to maybe go get a little piece of bread, a little, cup, a little piece of cracker and a cup so we can participate in the table together later. Psalm 147.3 really jumped out at me this week. It says he, he heals the brokenhearted, and he binds up, he bandages their wounds. That's our God. What a great God. And he's the one we've come to worship and learn from this morning. So I want to open with a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for being a God who cares about us, who cares about us individually, who cares about people. God, this morning we pray that we could give you all we have in worship, that you'd be glorified. And then we pray that you would speak to us from your word. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand and sing. Savior of the world 
Well, good morning, Grace Church. Nice. I like it. My name is Pastor John Blanchard. I'm the associate pastor here at Grace Church. It is good to be with you all this morning. Uh, I'm here to do announcements and offering time. I wanted to give you a little bit of a touch base on yesterday's men's event, though. We got to watch a lot of punters play because there (laughs) wasn't a whole lot of scoring in the beginning of the game. But it was a great event. A lot of good guys turned out. Some bad ones, but, you know, they sat in the back. Uh, But it was a good time. A uh, way that we can get you guys involved if you're not involved in some of those things is through Connect Cards. So if you haven't filled out a Connect Card or if you've been waiting on it or you have old information, take that time to fill it out online. You can fill it out in the pew and turn it into the offering box in the back. But it's a good way for us to just keep your current information so that you have some of the stuff going on in your emails and things like that. Um, with that being said, we do have some things coming up. The first of which I want to talk about is the Bible studies. So women's Bible studies meets on Tuesdays. They started last week. I think I heard some really good things from that. And so you can still get involved. Um, It's just the beginning. So they probably talked a lot. Uh, So there was an introductory period. Uh, Men's Bible study as well is on Wednesday nights. Uh, Again, we'd love to see you. We had a good turnout. I see almost 20 guys were in the room. And so it's a good turnout, good conversation. So we want to we want to see God working in, in your lives through that Bible study. So if you can get involved, it'd be a great opportunity. Uh, next, we do have a women's retreat coming up, Thrive, and it is October 14th through the 16th. There's a lot of details on how to get signed up, and if you're the first 10, which are the first 10 passed. No, so you can still get that discount, Um, but if you want to get involved in that women's retreat, please reach out to the staff here at the church or see uh, Miss Debbie for that. Uh, She'll get you all the information, get you plugged in. It's going to be a great weekend. I know that my wife is excited and my sister is going to go because my wife was so excited. She just wanted to bring her too. Uh, So it'll be a good time to get involved. After that, we we have offering. And it's just a great time to come and remember what God's doing. I was just sitting there thinking about exalted one and how God truly is exalted. But through him, he's got this master plan and God's in control. And so I just was thinking like, if God knew what was going to happen through his son, if God knew that sin was going to enter the world, then he knew what's going to happen tomorrow. And tomorrow's tomorrow. And so we can trust in him that if we abide in him, if we have faith in him, he will take care of us. And so with that being said, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for what you're doing here at Grace Church. Some of the awesome things that are happening. The people that we got to see out yesterday as they were having a good time, just enjoying fellowship. And God, I just pray that as people come and they give in the various ways, whether through online or through mail or through in person or through the app, God, I just pray that you bless the giver and you bless the church as we, as we steward those funds, as those resources. God, you're doing great things, and we just thank you for what you already have done, what you have planned for this place, and we just continue to, to hope to bless you through all the ministries that we have here at Grace Church. And we pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. Now take a time to stand up and greet one another around you. Smile. Fake smile if you have to. Wipe the crust out of the eyes. Good morning. I hate to be a killjoy, but uh, y'all got to sit down. <laughs> oh, no, seriously, I hate to interrupt when everybody's visiting with one another. Um, so, you know, our HVAC has been an issue for like two years, right? And um, we're still waiting on parts for uh, a pump to make sure that our AC is working right. So, if it's too cold, I apologize. But the exciting thing is there's a brand new boiler sitting in that that boiler room. Yeah. 
Let's give God a hand. And then I want to give you guys a hand because you've, you've been giving towards it. We haven't had to have a thermometer up here saying, you know, this is where we're at. You guys are just faithfully giving towards it. We're, we're well over halfway to, to paying it off. Um, and so I just want to encourage you to continue to, to pray about that. It still has to be programmed. So physically it's hooked up. All the pipes are, you know, put together. It, it holds water, that kind of thing. Now we just got to wait on the electronic part of where they program it and all that stuff. So keep praying, but I'm pretty excited, right? It's, this, is, this is cool. Um, so this week, I'm also excited, we're going to begin a new sermon series. And it's titled, uh, The End of the Age. Now, I, I think we can all agree we live in very unsettling times, right? There are many issues, right, both domestically and globally, and, and sometimes they're the same. Uh, we're, we're wrestling with uh, the rising crime rates. That's not only here in the U.S., but, but around the world. There's famines, there's pandemics, there's an increase in, in religious persecution. There's more persecution of Christianity right now than there was a thousand years ago. It's just we're, we're living in unsettled times. And, and people are asking, I know in, in my, if I'm going to be honest with you, there's times when I'm asking, you know, uh, questions like, are we in the end times? Like, is, is it here? How, how bad does it have to get before it is the end of the age if we're not in it yet? And, and question, simple questions like, when's Jesus coming back? Now, granted, I'm 63, and there's more behind me than there is in front of me, and the idea of Jesus coming back is really enticing to me. You know, it's like, okay, I've kind of done my thing, but when I talk to my, my adult children, they're like, you know, I'm not really ready for Jesus to come back. Um, but some of us, when we start looking at the times that we're living in, we're kind of hoping, you know, maybe Jesus does need to come back. So here's, here's what I want to do. Over the next nine weeks, we're going to examine Matthew 24 and 25. Because these two chapters record Jesus' teaching about the end of the age. Now, simply put, in terms of, of a definition, the end of the age or the end times, it speaks about a period when God will bring judgment on the earth and on its wicked inhabitants and establish his kingdom. So, as you read the Old Testament and the New Testament, it's not uncommon to come across language which speaks of the end times, the last days, the end of the age. In fact, in the book of Acts, Luke records the Old Testament prophet Joel as, as saying, And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Now, the reason Luke records this is because this was part of Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. As the Holy Spirit has come and the church is established and Peter steps out into Jerusalem and begins to proclaim the gospel, he quotes Joel, who's declaring that the last days have come because the Spirit has been poured out on people. It's been poured out on all who believe that Jesus is God and who believe that he died to atone for, to cover for, to pay for their sins. The coming of the Spirit at Pentecost, now, the, the, the actual coming of the Spirit at Pentecost where, where he descended on those who believe in Jesus. Jesus has, has died, been buried, he's rose again, he's ascended to the Father, and now the Spirit has come. That brings uh, a, 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 the, the end times into a different kind of focus than, than any other uh, Old Testament or Old Testament believer ever had. It, it brings it into focus in a way that, that the prophets never expected. See, the period we live in now, known as the church age, you could say, you could say exists as a large parenthesis in God's plan because the prophets didn't see it. It's like being on, on a tee box, looking at the green and thinking it's flat all the way, but you fail to see the valley in between. The prophets didn't see that. And, and so... The New Testament writers, they even write of this time that we live in as a mystery. Because it's not spoken about directly by the prophets of old. Now we need to realize though that the church age, this is not a parenthesis in God's plan. It is God's plan to redeem his creation. To redeem the world 
and the people. Like the New Testament writers, we too struggle, though, with the reality that the last days, wait for it, that the last days are both here now and yet to come. We're, we're living in a here now and yet to come kind of mindset. This was the thing Paul struggled with immensely. Paul gets knocked off his horse, right, on the way to Damascus to destroy the church. And Jesus says, stop, you know, why are you persecuting me? And, and Paul has this whole interchange with the risen Lord and comes to believe that Jesus is God and that he's risen from the dead, that he is Messiah. And now Paul has this theological crisis in his head. Because for the Messiah to have come, and it was the end of the age, but Paul's living in it right now, and it's not happening the way he thought it was going to happen. So we're going to wrestle with this over the next several weeks. And we're going to look at Matthew to understand how we should live in light of the fact that we live in the end of the age, but it's yet to come. It's both and. Our, our sermon title this morning is Don't Get Distracted. Don't get distracted. We'll be in two passages of Scripture this morning, starting in Matthew 24, verses 1 to 3. And then we're going to move to 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. Our study, we're going to break it up in two parts. We're going to break it up into Matthew, verses 1 to 3, and 1 John chapter, chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. We're going to call it Buildings and Things... In Matthew, and then we're going to call it Attitudes and Affections in 1 John. So if you would, turn in your Bible. We're going to start in Matthew 24. So turn in your Bibles to Matthew 24, and I'm going to read verses 1 to 3. All right, Matthew 24. If you have, have one of those fancy electronic devices, scroll there with us. Matthew 24, verses 1 to 3. Here's what Matthew records. He writes this, Jesus left the temple and was going away. When his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple, but he that is Jesus answered them, you see all these, do you not? Surely I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. As he said on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the close of the age? Here's what I want us to, to take away this morning. If nothing else, it's this. Do not become distracted by the things of the world. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. And we ask now that your spirit would speak to our spirit the things we need to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. So buildings and things. Now, the passage comes on the heels of a section which records Jesus' teaching in the temple. And I'm going to ask you to back up into chapter 23 to verse 37 to 39. And I want to read those now because this gives us some context as to what's going on in the, in the noodles of the disciples. Right, what, what are they thinking? Right, this is Jesus speaking. You might have a, a section title over it saying, Lament over Jerusalem. This, this is Jesus' sadness over Jerusalem because he's presented himself and he's been rejected. They, they have not embraced Messiah when he came. And so Jesus realizes this is it. And he's lamenting. He's, he's sorrowful. And he says this, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes. In the name of the Lord. Matthew picks up the narrative. He says, Jesus left the temple and was going away, and the disciples came to point out to him the buildings. Hey, Master, check out these buildings. 
Jesus is lamenting. He's, he's sorrowful at the fact that the Jewish nation has repeatedly, through the millennia, rejected God. He points out that the religious establishment has, has killed the prophets and, and that they've stoned those sent to the nation by God. The nation has rejected God, and now, now he says their, their house, their proverbial house will be desolate, empty. God is compassionate but cannot tolerate sin. We have to understand that. He's compassionate. He would have gathered them as a hen gathers its chicks under its wings. I've never seen that until like uh, several months ago. It was in the spring. There's a bird called a killdeer that likes to to nest in flat, open areas. And I I think I mentioned this to you one Sunday morning. I walked into church, and there was like this clump of something. And as I got closer... Mama killed her, stood up and raised her wings, and all these little chicks ran out. That's the image that, that Jesus uses that God wanted to do with Jerusalem, wanted to do with the, the nation of Israel. He wanted to gather them and nurture them and protect them and care for them. And they said, no, no, no. God's compassionate, but he can't tolerate sin. God longs to nurture and protect his people, but at the same time, he's a righteous God, a holy God. Now, this understanding of God is going to be key as we go through this whole, this whole series. So Matthew states that, the G, that, that Jesus and the disciples, they're, they're leaving the temple. They're leaving it for the night. They're headed east out of the city, out of the temple. They're... During the Passover, they've been staying in Bethany, so they're headed east back towards Bethany. And kind of just to help us again understand the <laughs> what's going through the disciples' head. Hey, have you ever walked through a big city and remarked about the buildings and their architecture? I remember the first time I was ever in New York City. I, it was obvious I was a tourist because I was walking around going, golly, look at them buildings, you know? I mean, it was just, it's amazing. It's like being in a canyon at times because the sky, they just go up and you're just like, whoa. And then every now and then you see a building that's just not steel and glass, but it's like actually got some architectural features to it. And you're like, wow. Like, has any, am I the only one, the, the hayseed that rolled into a big city and went, whoa, look at that. Or maybe this, maybe you do this. Again, I'm sharing secrets of the Simpson family. We, we like to drive around and look at houses we could never afford. Anybody else? I want to see hands on this. Anybody ever drive around in fancy neighborhoods and look at houses? Do you ever do it at night? That's even better. Debbie and I are always looking to see if we can see like a grand piano in a big picture window or something, you know? Right? And, and you talk about it, and, and you, you know you could never afford it, but you're like happy for people that can because it's just so cool. When we were out in Kansas just recently visiting my, uh, my daughter and, and son-in-law, they took us into Kansas City to this really posh, ritzy neighborhood. Like, our comment was, we've never driven through a, a subdivision like this. This was simply amazing. Uh, that's kind of where the, it's kind of where the disciples' head was at, Right? They're looking at the temple, and they're, they're saying, this is amazing. Like, th- this is the vibe you got to pick out from this. They walk out of the city of Jerusalem. They're on the way out of the temple. Jesus had just said, Jerusalem's going to be desolate. And they're thinking, how? This, this temple's not even finished yet. And it's so grand and so big and so awesome. See, Herod began the the construction of the temple in 20 B.C., and it didn't end until 64 A.D., and this is like 30 A.D. It's, it's like right in the middle of the time when it's being built. It took 84 years to build this temple. It's not yet complete, and it's already amazing. Uh, there, there's a, a scale model in Jerusalem. Never been there, but I found a picture of it right there. Now, a- as you look at that, what you're looking at is what we know today as the Temple Mount. All right? Historians believe this is basically what the, the temple looked like. You, you've heard of the Temple Mount, 
right? You've heard of the Wailing Wall. The Wailing Wall is part of the, the, the uh, reinforcing walls that hold up the Temple Mount. That whole area is like 36 acres, that square. 36 acres of land that needed a retaining wall there into the valley and everywhere else to keep it, to keep it all level, that they could then build on a solid foundation the Temple of God. The, the blocks in that wall weigh tons and tons. Blocks, that they've measured them at 45 feet long, 12 feet high, and 15 feet deep. These are huge, huge blocks. Now, that's not the size of the blocks that, that actually built the, the, the temple proper there. But when, when you read in the Gospels or even in Acts and it says they're in Solomon's portico, see all those columns? That's Solomon's portico. That whole big plaza area was known as the... the uh, the court of the Gentiles. That's where anybody could go to worship God. That's the court that Jesus drove everybody out of and said, you've made my house into a, uh, it's into a den of thieves. This is the, the, the Temple Mount. And so they come out, they probably came out of that one gate down at the bottom. They come out of the temple, and as they're walking out, the disciples are going, dude, check out these blocks. Check out this building. This is an amazing structure, right? And in the back of their mind, they're like, whoa, this is so cool. Look at this building. And then the other part of them is like, this could never be desolate. It was a spectacular sight to behold. But Jesus, the way I read this is he paused on the way out. So they're going, Master, look at this. And he pauses. And he says, you see all these, do you not? And I can see Jesus standing there with understanding in his eyes. Because he's going to lay a big one on them. You see all these stones, right? They're like, yeah. And there probably is a bit of a lament left in him still. As he gets ready to say the rest of this. He's watching them. He's looking into their eyes, and he's waiting for them to nod their heads, and they all stop, and they realize something big's coming. And he uses his go-to phrase to make a point. Truly, truly, I say to you. So he says, truly, I say to you, there will, be not, there, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. The disciples' mind's blown, right? They're just... How can this be? This, this is how those of us that watched the, the Twin Towers fall, this is how we felt that day. How could this happen? How could this happen? Within a matter of hours, those skyscrapers were rubble. How could this happen? And they're thinking, how will this happen? Who? How? Is this going to take place? Who's going to make this into a bunch of rubble? The historical reality, though, is this. Six years after its completion in 64 A.D., six years later in 70 A.D., the Roman army dismantled the temple, burned it to the ground, and threw all the stones off. All that was left was the retaining wall in the 36-acre plot of ground. Hard to believe. Jesus called it. And he called it, and it happened within the disciples' lifetime. They no doubt thought back to their, their, their feelings for the temple. Because for the Jews, see, the Jews understood the kingdom would be established by Messiah, and it would be an earthly kingdom. And they understood the temple was, the temple was so important to them. Because for them, that's where God resided. And they knew Messiah was going to come. And the disciples had already come to confess Jesus as Messiah. There's that one passage in John where all his, a lot of his disciples are walking away. And he looks at the 12 and he said, will you walk away too? And they say, where would we go? You're the one with the words of life. They've confessed him as Messiah. They've seen him do great things. And so in their mind... They're typically Old Testament Jewish believers. They understand the kingdom would be established by Messiah and would be an earthly kingdom. They believe this would happen at the end of the age. 
and a resurrection would occur at the same time. The disciples believed that Jesus would usher in an earthly kingdom. He'd give Rome the boot, kick them out of town, establish his kingdom, and they'd sit on 12 thrones with him. Remember, they kept arguing, who's going to be most important in the kingdom? Who'll sit on your right and on your left, Jesus? In fact, James and John even got their mother to go to Jesus and ask, can my son sit on your right and your left? I mean, that's how petty they got in their thinking. Grown men, tough fishermen. Hey, uh, Mom, would you go talk to Jesus for us and see if you can convince him to? I mean, that sounds like stuff we would do in high school. Mom, can you write me a note? My paper's not done yet. Tell the teacher, you know, I was... So this is the mindset of the disciples. They thought this was all going to happen at once. And they were thinking with a self-centered, worldly focus. Now in the weeks ahead, we're going to wrestle with how we should understand and, and answer the two questions they're going to ask. See, they, they ask these two questions in verse 3, right? First, they ask when the destruction of the temple will take place. When's it going to happen? Then also in verse 3, they ask a second question, which is really two questions at at the same time. What will be the sign of your coming again? Which they couple with a second question, what will be the sign of the close of the age? See, they know he's going to come again. They know he's Messiah, and they know he's going to set up his earthly kingdom, and they want to be part of it, and they want to know when it's going to happen. We're going to wrestle with this as we go on because this is what 24 and 25 are all about. Today I want us to pause and consider the nature of our relationship to this world. though. What's the nature of our relationship to this world and to our culture? Because we, we don't want to become distracted by the things of the world. So let's look at attitudes and affections. So if you would, turn or scroll to, to 1 John chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 15 to 17. I'm going to read those, and then we're going to grab some thoughts out of that. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. Here's what John, one of the 12, one of the disciples, this is what he writes years later. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride and possessions is not from the Father, but it's from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. I'm pretty certain we can learn something about ourselves as we look at the disciples and we, we unpack this passage in 1 John. Because I look at the disciples and I look at us and I kind of look in the same way at us. I see a group of men who are stuck in a worldly perspective and not a spiritual pers- pers- perspective. And I think we get stuck in that spot as well at times. I also believe their attitudes and affections regarding this world, they're similar to ours because they're cut from the same cloth. The men are studying the the, the disciples and they're looking, the the title of the study is Ordinary Men. They're ordinary guys, ordinary people, cut from the same cloth as you and I. So I think we can learn from them here with what John's written. So from a very simple logic, as you look at these verses, you could summarize it this way. Don't love the world or the things in the world because it is passing away. Don't love the world or the things in the world because it is passing away. The world's not our home. We discovered that when we were going through 1 Peter. The world's not our home. We're exiles. We're living in a foreign land. We want to get comfortable here. And... And, and it's okay to make ourselves comfortable and be stewards, key, stewards of what we have, but this is not our home. Again, back to my daughter and, and son-in-law. They, he's in the military. Uh, he's at school now for, he, he's an officer. He's at school now for 10 months. 
So for 10 months, they're going to be living in Leavenworth, as he's, at, he's posted at Fort Leavenworth. 10 months. My daughter wants to put down roots. She wants to be comfortable. And she's wrestling with this. And I don't blame her. She made their, their, their rental as, as pleasant and as nice as it can be for the two of them. But she's also got it in her back of her mind, I've got to pack this all back up again. I'm not going to be here after 10 months. We have to wrestle with this ourselves. It, it seems like we're here forever, but we're not. And this isn't our home. So John tells us don't love the world or the things in the world because it's all passing away. We have a choice regarding our attitudes and affections. And for my daughter, she made a choice. Okay, this is as good as it's going to get. We're here for 10 months. I'll make it do, and then we're moving. Okay, I can live with that. She made a choice. We have to make choices regarding our attitudes and affections. John states, if you love the world, then the love of the Father, wait for it, then the love of the Father is not in you. Ouch. He makes it clear that everything which is in the world is not from the Father. When he says the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of possessions is not from the Father, but is from the world. The love of the world keeps us from loving the Father. I've seen that in my own life. When I get, when, when, when my eyes get off the target, when I don't keep my eyes on the ball, when I don't focus on the finish line, The love of the world keeps us from loving the Father. This love of the world is not about what we do. It's not about what we own or even where we go. F.F. F. Bruce, in his commentary on 1 John, defines the love of the world this way. Now listen to this. Bruce says this. It lies in the human heart in the set of human affections and attitudes. See, it, it doesn't lie, right? It doesn't lie in, in what we do with our life. It doesn't lie in what we own in life. It doesn't lie in where we go. I think Bruce has it hit, hit the nail on the head. It lies where? In our, in our heart, in the set of human affections and attitudes. Our love of the world reveals itself in affections which, we take, which take their cue from the culture's definition of good and bad. Our love of the world is revealed in, in the cues we take from culture. It can show up in attitudes and affections which unthinkingly go with the current cultural beliefs or governmental policies. It, the, the love of the world can be as subtle or as overt as, as it can. Either way, subtly or overtly, Either way, it's the, the love of the world is not consistent with the love of the Father. Don't become distracted by the things of the world. We, we love the world subtly when we unquestionably go along with current cultural trends. It's, it's so easy to get sucked in subtly to current cultural trends like, like the LGBTQ agenda. Unfortunately, our world only offers a script of deception for those who are struggling with their identity. The gospel offers a different script, one of redemption and then identity as a child of God, as, as, a, as an image bearer of, of Him. As a follower of Christ, we're, we're called to love our neighbor. We're called not to love them if they're easy to love. We're called to love them even when they're in their brokenness. But that call doesn't mean we accept and validate our neighbor's sin. It, it means that, that in our loving of them, we need to offer a different script than the world. A script that says, don't follow this because it feels good. Follow this because it is good. The Father has given his Son to die for our sin that we might be made anew. A new creation. A child of him. C.S. 
So often the world pushes for validation of sin which denies God's created order. And that's where the, the, this whole LGBTQ agenda is. It's denying God's order. God made us man and woman. He made us together to be man and woman. We're made in his image for his glory, not for ours. The, the, the world always presents and promotes a belief that blurs the image of God in people. And in this case, it subtly promotes an anti-God, anti-human kind of belief. The subtle deception influences us through our, our media. We're bombarded by it all the time. And we're bombarded with shame that if we don't go along and validate them, we're, we're bad people. We're not loving. But it's not about validation. It's about wanting the best for another person, and the gospel is the best for another person. Consider what the author of Hebrews says. Chapter 2, verse 1, he says this. Therefore, we must pay closer attention to what we have heard. Wait for it. Lest we drift away from it. It's so easy to let the world and its messaging just kind of grab us and pick us up and kind of move us off target. Move us away from pressing forward to the finish line. We can't let the world think for us. And, it, and I feel like that's where the disciples were at. They were caught up in the me, the, the, the medlu of, of uh, a Messiah coming and, and, and a new kingdom and and. And it was all an earthly thought. They were, they were going to sit on thrones with Jesus. And, and they, they, in fact, didn't even want him to go to, to Jerusalem the, the last time because they didn't want him to die on the cross. That's not what God has for you. We know God's plan for you is not to die on the cross. And they were wrong. They were thinking totally in a worldly sense. You see it at the very beginning of Mark. Jesus gets up early, goes off to be by himself. Disciples don't know where he is. They go looking for him. And their comment is... Everybody's looking for you. The implication is people are lining up to be healed. Like, we got a good thing going here, Jesus. We should, like, open up shop here. Jesus' response to them says, it, no, we're going to go to other towns, for that's why I've come. I've come to preach the good news. We can't let the world think for us and cause us to drift from the gospel. Now, we overtly love the world with our attitudes when we make possessions, power, and position our goal in life, right? When our life is spent on the accumulation of power, wealth, and influence, we don't have the love of the Father in us. We can't let the world distract us. We're called to be stewards of all that God has given us. We're called to use it for His glory. Jesus states in the Sermon on the Mount, no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or he will de be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Matthew 6, 24. See, do not become distracted by the things of the world. The disciples love the world. We love the world. They were awestruck by the temple. They, they argued continually about who was most important. They even tried to keep Jesus from going to the cross, right? They would not accept God's plan. Let's not be like that. Let's, let's decide we're going to change the way we think in our lives. The only way the disciples overcame the love of the world was through the indwelling of the Spirit of God and their willingness to let the Spirit lead in their life can't be distracted by the world. We, we must always yield to the Spirit and abide in the Word. So important. As we move through this series, I want you to keep something in mind as we go through Matthew 24 and 25. The purpose of prophecy is to call us to holy living in the present. It's not to inform us of the future. That's not the purpose. It's for us to say, if this is our future, how am I living now? 
That's what the prophets were all about in the Old Testament. How are you going to live now in the present in light of what you just heard about the future? Don't become distracted by the things of the world. Action point, yield to the Spirit. Let the Spirit have His will and way in you. Walk in Him. Be characterized by Him. Live in Him and abide. Take up residence in His Word, in God's Word. We can rejoice this morning. You know why? This world is not all there is. It's not. There's more to life than this world. Let's shift gears. I want us to to talk about the Lord's table. I was working on Advent material because it's Christmas is right around the corner. Nobody wants to hear that, I know, especially me. I'm kind of a Christmas Eve shopper, and that never works out because we have Christmas Eve service. So I'm more of like a, a, a three-day ahead-of-time shopper. So to, to know that it's coming right, it's scary. Anyways, I was working on Advent material. And again, I was in 1 John. In, in chapter 3, 5, chapter 3, verse 5. It says that Jesus came to take away the sins of the world and that he's sinless and that in him there is no sin. I was blown away. Because the table, the table is a time, and, and here at Grace Church, you don't have to be a member of Grace Church to participate in the Lord's table. But it's a time for those who know Jesus as their Savior to, to stop dead in their tracks, stop for a moment and say, okay, I'm going to remember something. And I'm going to remember the gospel. I'm going to remember like Jesus told us to. You know, that night he was betrayed, he, he took the bread. And he said, this is my body. It was to represent a sinless life. Jesus came to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. This is what this piece of bread represents. A a, a sinless life. Think of it. A life with no sin. I'm going to give you a few moments to think about this and give thanks to God that he lived a sinless life because you can't, I can't. We can't live a sinless life, but Jesus could, and he did. And that's what this bread represents. So take a few moments of of quietness just here in your heart and think about this and give thanks that he did what you couldn't do. And then I'll pray and then we'll eat together. Lord, we thank you. We thank you, God, that you you came to earth and lived a sinless life because we can't and we don't. But you could and you did. And for that, we're thankful. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's eat together. That same night, Jesus, he passed the bread around. And it's believed that in the Passover meal, he picked up the third cup, which is the the cup of redemption in the Passover meal. And he gave that a new meaning. He said, this is my blood which is shed for you. Now, the reason he could shed his blood for us and die in our place, you know the answer. It's because we didn't live a sinless life and we couldn't. We needed someone to 
to be a sacrifice for us. And it was Jesus. He came to take away the sins of the world, and in him there was no sin. His disciples were wrestling with the, the issues of the world. We wrestle with issues of the world, but let's pause for a moment and, and remember that all this doesn't matter. What matters is that Jesus came and he died for our sins. His blood was poured out for us because we couldn't. There's no good in us that was good enough to pay for our sins. But he did. And so we have this little cup of juice to remind us of that. I'm going to give you a few moments again of quietness just to remember that, that Jesus died in your place. And then I'll pray and we'll drink together. God, we thank you that your plan, your plan was, was always that there would be Jesus' death on the cross. Your plan was always that there would be a church age. Your plan was always that the gospel would be declared, that Jesus died for our sins, and that we must believe and seek forgiveness in him. Thank you for the reminder that this cup brings of that truth. we pray in Jesus name amen let's drink together and all God's people said amen amen I have a few songs that I really enjoy some of them are old hymns some of them are current when I first heard the song we're gonna do next I was preaching through a, a series in Revelation and this this song just kind of blew me away. The, the songwriter did a great job capturing heaven and our, our great God. So if you'd stand and sing with us, uh, let's worship our great God.
that. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. So, God, um, we thank you for being who you are. And we don't want, we don't want to be stuck in a worldly mindset. God, so we pray. We pray that we would yield to your spirit, that he would, would come and reside in us in a powerful way. Lord, he's already here. We just need to yield to him. And we pray, God, that we would walk in him and abide in your word. To that end, we ask a blessing on each one this morning as we leave this place. You would fill us with a multitude of your grace and a multitude of your peace. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have a great week. We love you all. What fortune lies beyond the stars Those thousand hearts too fast to climb I got so high to fall so far But I found heaven as love swept low My heart beating My soul breathing I found my life When I laid it down I put it falling Spirit soaring I touched the sky When my knees said